All right, so you know we're gonna do um, the mild procedure, um, which is uh, in decompression of the lumbar spine. Using this spine, we've already squared off the L3 and L4 levels here. Um, so a picture, picture. So this is our targeted, you know, area where we're running into ligamentum uh, flavum hypertrophy. Picture. One, one more picture here. So our target is sort of the lamina located right at the L4 level here. Um, picture. So it's right there, you know, between the pedicle and the spinous process. So to, to begin the procedure, we actually start the level below. And using the natural curvature of the spine, we're actually going to tra traject our needles and our tools sort of in this trajectory here. Kind of right in that trajectory. So the initial you know, incision with mild is very small um, picture. So we start right at the spinous process here of L4, picture, and picture. So this is where we'll kind of start. You know, we'll mark off the area here. And then that's where we'll make a little bit of an incision, kind of down to the bone there. And then introduce our, our needle and trocar into that area there. Picture there, and then just kind of change it up here. Picture. We'll work our way out. So we're going to assume this person has you know, spinal stenosis, but predominantly left-sided symptoms. The, you know, the procedure can be done on both sides, um, obviously based on what the patient's symptoms are. So we've touched down on the lamina right here, picture. Kind of sliding off there a little bit. Picture again. There we go. And so we'll sort of remove the needle here. And then we'll use this device here to kind of stabilize our, our cannula onto the lamina there. Kind of looks just like that. We'll adjust it a little bit. And right there. Sure. There we go. And then we will use this as our gauge here also to stabilize here. Yeah, and then we're going to go 45 degrees contralateral oblique away from our left side, so to the right there. And we're basically looking for the shelves of the lamina here. Picture. So you can see them. I'm going to kind of outline them here. Um, picture. 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 Yeah, here. So on the actual screen itself, I think they can see the screen though. Yeah, so you can see the shelves of the lamina there at L4 and L5, right where the cannula is sitting. So just inferior to the cannula, you can see the L4 shelf of the lamina there. So following that, once you're stabilized on the lamina, we'll actually introduce this little device here which is, actually has some teeth on the end of it, where you're going to sort of remove some of the bone away off that lamina. So you could see it there, right there. So it has this, almost looks like a scoop. And you can turn this to scoop away or scoop, you know, for the, for the L3 level that we're trying to get to, we're going to scoop the bottom of the lamina. For the L4, we're going to scoop the top of it. So we'll have to make some rotational movements on this. So we'll introduce this. Picture. So you can see it there kind of coming. So we're going to ride the lamina sort of to the picture again, to the, to the very tip there, staying on bone the whole time. Picture. There you go. Picture. Yeah. Picture again. 
And so we get just to the edge of that lamina and you kind of feel yourself coming off the shelf of the lamina and falling just underneath it. Picture there. It's a lot of osteophytes on this one. There we go. Picture. So we're, yeah, so we're a little bit deep there. So we pull back. Picture. It's kind of roughing through some of the lamina. And then what we do, picture. Come back. Picture. There you go. So what we do is we are now in a position where we can scrape the bottom of the L4 lamina. So we take a couple bites by pulling down and pulling out. And then you can see kind of under here where we've sort of pulled some tissue off. There you go. So you're working the underside of the lamina where the ligamental flavum inserts. Some bone, bone structures on there. Then you go back in with the same trajectory and change the positioning a little bit more. In the model. And picture. Picture again. Let me keep kind of diving this back down to the same area there. Picture. Put back, and then we we pull pull upwards just to get under that lamina. Picture. There you go. And then we again pull, and you do this three times, and you can see again, pulling lamina off. So then we would do one more in the same direction, but I'm going to sort of flip the, the device here and go to, and kind of push it downwards to get to the L3 now picture. So we'll come this way, still kind of pushing it down. Here we go, kind of coming towards that L3 now, towards the bottom shelf picture. And then we push it, kind of get a little, little bit deeper there. Picture. 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 Yeah, picture. Yeah, so we're now on that shelf of that L3 which is what we're trying to get at, to get to scrape off the bottom of that L3. There you go. And then we kind of dive it, and get it under, which is what I'm kind of feeling now. Picture. There we go. And then this thing, picture. And then we're going to give it some downward traction so that we can really sc scrape the bottom of that lamina there. So we do that. And then you can see a big kind of chunk of bone there coming off. You could see it there. And so you do that again, you know, you do that three times to open up that space for us to get in there. And we do a tool exchange, and then we have this device here, which is able to scoop some of the ligament, um, ligaments and flavum that's hypertrophied. So you can see how it has this, almost looks like a plucking device, a little, I call it a shovel with a scoop. Yeah, so this is called a tissue sculptor that you're gonna insert into that same area that you created a little bit of a void now, picture. Make sure we get in there, picture. And so you enter that space there, picture that you just created, picture, picture, picture. And then you pretty much go in and scoop the ligament out. So we got some there, you can see it there. And you can do, based on what you see on your MRI findings of how much hypertrophy and ligaments and flavum hypertrophy there is, um, you can take two bites, you can take three bites. Typically, we take three bites, but if people have a little bit more hypertrophy, you may end up taking a few more bites. Uh, picture. We do the same thing here. Take a big bite. And you got some more here. <clears throat> and then we just kind of, we remove everything and um, like I said, the incision is nothing more than a port. So it's very, very small, as you can kind of see on the body there. And it's closed up, and the person is able to just, you know, hopefully walk out asymptomatic or at least have very minimal symptoms after this. Uh, Patrick, uh, who do you consider an optimal patient for this? What presentation so is I'm, seen in the office when the patient walks in? So I'm basically looking for the person who's basically wanting to sit on a chair right away. Um, they're walking hunched over. They may not be a very healthy patient. 
Um, they may, you may ask them about their, uh, what they do at a grocery store and look for, the, look for that classic grocery cart sign where they're, they're either looking to find the motorized, motorized cart or they're gonna look for a cart to lean on the whole time. So those are, those are the big ones. But I think when they walk into your office, they're either coming in a wheelchair because they can't walk or they're looking to sit down right away. And from an uh, anesthetic perspective, uh, how is this uh, patient, is this patient uh, have the procedure under sedation, under anesthesia, or is this done under local? So I think all three are valid because of the size of the, the needle site and the incision that we're making. Um, I think when you're first starting off, starting with monitoring anesthesia care is probably appropriate. Um, but then as you get more comfortable and depending on a patient's you know, I guess their psyche, if you want to call it that, they could be a person you could do under conscious sedation. Um, possibly not local, but definitely, I don't think general anesthesia is needed for something that's 20 minutes, possibly 30 minutes. Um, they probably have more risk. And if you're doing this case, they're likely not great surgical candidates or they don't want surgery. So, you know, they probably have a high anesthesia risk to begin with. So this is a presentation of uh, a patient with uh, lumbar spinal stenosis, neurogenic claudication, ambulatory intolerance, uh, who has comorbidities that uh, make it more appealing to try to, uh, under limited circumstances, have a limited uh, expectation of accomplishment without complication. What are the adverse events and how do you manage them? So one of the big, you know, I guess one of the only or big things that we want to make sure we don't get are, you know, dural tear or CSF leak. Um, you know, sometimes with the, the sculpting tool and the devices here, you can end up um, getting a little bit too deep and creating a CSF leak, especially if someone is, you know, moderate to severe stenosis, which are what these patients are. So they're, you know, they don't have a lot of CSF to work with. Um, so what you end up, if this tool gets a little bit too uh, deep, then that's the one big um, side effect or adverse event that people have. Typically, it's not a pain response or it's not an incisional pain because of how small the, the procedure is. Um, it's usually that, you know, dural tear or, you know, leak, if you want to call it that. So for uh, this size incision, uh, the challenge of a CSF leak is smaller uh, than in the larger open incisions. But in that uh, previous conversation that we had, uh, uh, where Dr. Nora was speaking about collaboration. Uh, is this a circumstance where you would have a, a, a open surgical colleague at least be aware that uh, this patient may need a CSF leak if the wound misbehaves in the first three weeks uh, after percutaneous procedure? Yeah, I think, you know, doing the case and if there's anything that, that's noted while doing it, you know, I, I kind of keep my spine colleagues or orthospine or neurosurgeons you know, adjust, you know, making sure they understand the situation. Um, if they end up in the hospital where they are on call, then, you know, I don't want to surprise them and say, you know, oh, this is my patient I did this procedure on, and they have no clue about it. So, you know, if we're, while doing the procedure, if we feel that something is off, then, you know, we want to keep our spine partners kind of just aware that this person could end up in the ED, but um, r as rare as it is, you, you want to do that due diligence in the partnership. Questions from the audience. Let me get a mic. Ben, do the, do the mics work to hit the button? Uh, so you have a, you also have a button right here that's a microphone and you can speak. Right <coughs> I have a question. Um, I know some um, spine, um, uh, some, some uh, specialists um, included a um, epidural with the uh, myo procedure. Do you recommend that? So I think when you're sort of first starting out, um, it's, it's kind of nice to see doing an interlaminar epidural at the level um, of interest, how the ligament actually looks and how your CSF flow is. Um, as you're going, I would say maybe 20% or 30% of physicians actually do the epidural nowadays. Um, they'll shoot contrast and actually visualize what the flow looks like pre and post mild. Um, I guess when you're first starting out, your first few cases, if you wanna really see how the decompression looks and making sure your landmarks are okay, it's probably, it's probably a wise idea to just insert some contrast in using an interlaminar approach. Uh, but as you get more comfortable, you'll realize what your landmarks are on your imaging and realize you don't really need to do an epidural. Uh, uh, 
when we mention lumbar uh, stenosis, I uh, usually confuse between the canal stenosis and the foraminal stenosis. Just I want to make sure this procedure for uh, canal stenosis, not foraminal stenosis, right? Correct. So it's for central stenosis, uh, primarily that's where the ligamentum hypertrophy occurs. Um, so that's where we're plucking it off from. Um, it doesn't really get to your foraminal stenosis. Perfect. And uh, um, from the MRI, how we determine the site we will operate when it comes to the levels and the laterality of the areas? So, so I think a lot of it is you're going to look at the MRI, measure out your ligaments and flavum. Some of your radiology partners may actually measure, already be measuring the ligaments and flavum. Um, and once it's projected, you're going to base your laterality on the patient's symptoms. You know, if they're having bilateral leg symptoms, bilateral, you know, when they walk, you're going to end up doing both sides. Um, I would say people tend to do bilateral more than unilateral, um, just because that's how stenosis ends up presenting. It's very rare for it to just be single-sided. Um, but in those instances where it's one-sided, that's when you would pick the side based on the person's symptoms, not really the MRI. Uh, more questions, please. Yes. Hi. I have a question. When you do this procedure, uh, would you be able to use maybe uh, at the end of the procedure you can use a scope and in order to, you know, to see, uh, 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 you know, what you did. Also, that's one question. And another one is if uh, when, you, uh, when you put the x-ray, you, I saw that you use a, a oblique position. Um, I wonder if you can use, for example, the oblique and, and, and you, you may turn to, to AP position. That way you see you are not going too lateral. You know? Okay, uh, so there are uh, two questions here. Uh, one is the visual verification of adequacy of decompression. And if I estimated right, that's looking down a five millimeter tube because your kerosene looked like it was a yeah. five millimeter. So it's, yeah. it's pinpoint. Okay, um, it's and then uh, confirming um, anatomic location by getting variable x-rays. Yeah, so the other view, I mean, I, I think the procedure does does its does best under contralateral oblique. You could always measure depth and check on lateral. Um, I don't. I wouldn't do the whole procedure on AP, um, just because you won't get a gauge of your depth on AP. Mm -hmm. Contralateral oblique gives you that opportunity with slightly less radiation. Obviously, you could do it on lateral because you're going to see the lamina and know ex your exact depth. Um, but there is a big portion of this is strictly on just feel. You know, if you're doing it, uh, interlaminar epidurals already you'll know the technique and what, what the lamina feels like. And once you're at that point, that's when you know, I think uh, this procedure is a little bit easier once you know how to do those epidurals. Um, and that way, all your imaging techniques, the contralateral oblique, will, will make perfect sense. So I assume your answer to direct visualization is no. No. Don't do direct <laughs> visualization. So uh, any other questions? So, so uh, we're all done with that. We'll move on to the... Uh, Next talk.